Hey, I'm Jeff Keeley here in Boston to go behind the scenes to hear some untold stories about the making of Bioshock with Ken Levine and Sean Robertson. Let's talk a bit about the theme and setting of Bioshock, Rapture. Uh, I think a lot of people, when they've played the game for the first time, can they wonder, how did you even dream up this place? And I know you've said publicly before that part of the reason you sort of, what led you to Rapture was this idea of fully simulating a place. Uh, tell us about that sort of idea and the frustrations you had with other games where they're, you sort of hit a bound. I think our philosophy is, was always to do what we were doing 100% rather than try to do something bigger and do it 50% or 40%. So one of the ideas of, you know, and this sort of came from System Shock 2 as well, where you focus on an area that you can really bring to life and you kind of eliminate the questions of, well, why can't I go over the bridge to New Jersey? So we were able to really make a place, I think, that felt believable and real, even though in actuality it was really quite limited. But we just sort of dressed it with all these buildings outside that were all, you know, they were all basically glorified fakes. We let the story drive what we needed to show rather than some kind of like predetermined map which we sat down, which is a little different than like System Shock 2 where we actually mapped a spaceship out deck by deck. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't know why the, the philosophy felt a little different there because you want to feel like a real spaceship that was, that was sort of stacked on top of each other. The rapture was free to sprawl across the ocean floor. Although you guys originally, John, were talking about doing this game on a sort of spaceship again, right? Yeah, when we first started talking about what the spiritual successor to System Shock 2 is going to be. Spaceship came up, but again, you know, we, we wanted a limited environment and we didn't necessarily want to do Spaceship again. And our first actual exploration of this space was underwater, but ultimately it ended up looking like a spaceship. It just happened to have a couple of you know, seaweed fronds out, out outside. And that started to push us towards uh, what artistic statement that we wanted to make to make this look different and what rules we were going to set for the world. How at every turn we were going to try to remind the player that they were in fact underwater and that this wasn't a spaceship. And how, like, underwater, we obviously know you did underwater, then sitting in the sky, like, what, where did you come up with the idea of, like, doing this underwater? I think there was probably a conversation. It's like, well, w what kind of places could be cut off from from yeah. other places? Yeah. Like, well, you know, a spaceship, a summer camp, <laughs> uh, you know, like yeah. any island notion, right? Something that's cut off from the rest of the world. Yeah. So you never felt like you should be able to go over that bridge to New Jersey. I don't want to apply some deep and meaningful conversation. I think it was one of those ideas that you just kind of say, and then everybody, huh, ah, that well, sounds cool. Let's try right, that. Let's that. let's right. go for it. And, and it, I think it lended itself to having very nice views out the window without having to build an insane amount of unique assets. Right. By today's standards, we still were a small team back then. And there's an expectation that because you're underwater, the view distances are going to be short. So you can really kind of fade out into the fog at a short distance and not have the expectation that why can't I see forever? So there's a lot of limitations in a good way that we put on ourselves by, by being underwater, as opposed to like, if you're on a cruise ship, then you'd expect to see across the water and we'd have to deal with that. Same thing with an island. Or in the city or sky. Where yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which was a lot more complicated. Yeah. yeah. So you, you came up with the idea of let's do this underwater. Let's do this sort of isolated place. Then you had to answer the question of, you know, why would someone build this? Is that sort of how it worked, sort of order of operations? You then had to come up with a story to explain? Yeah, uh, it, I think the we wanted a very believable reason why they'd be there. Right. And sort of the, the necessary isolation of, of the place sort of led to, well, what kind of person would want to do this? And um, I wasn't even particularly aware of the sort of political implications of what I was reading, but I've been reading, um, I had read The Fountainhead. Right. Um, by Ayn Rand, and I mostly thought it was an interesting story. Like, I didn't realize that people were sort of basing their sort of political mm -hmm. lives around it, because yeah. um, I wasn't that tuned in to that stuff at that point. And so, but I love the the dialogue and the kind of speechifying in it, because you can see a video game character speaking with that kind of certainty and that kind of confident um, philosophy. It just seemed like a, a natural, a natural kind of thing to apply to, to this place, and so it just sort of all came together as a very, as a sort of a, a, a who is the guy who would do this? Well, right. you know that character, 
Um, he was sort of this amalgamation of characters from Ayn Rand's books and from Ayn Rand herself. This sort of idealistic person who says, well, the only way to do this is to separate from the rest of the world. And that led to Andrew Ryan. I am Andrew Ryan, and I'm here to ask you a question. Is a man not entitled to the sweat of his brow? No, says the man in Washington, it belongs to the poor. No, says the man in the Vatican, it belongs to God. No, says the man in Moscow, it belongs to everyone. We knew from a technical standpoint that we wanted isolation. We also knew to sell it, we needed a compelling storyline, a backstory that why would this place exist? Otherwise, how are we going to make Rapture feel like it's lived in if we don't have the reason for it to be there? So w once once we decided on the underwater location and then the closed off spaces, that objectivist story kind of came in and came in and made, and made the art stronger and made the level design stronger because we could feed back into that loop. And I think that's why we had to have sort of Andrew Ryan's pitch right at the beginning of the game. We wanted people to understand why somebody would go there. And so he makes this very personal one-to-one -one pitch to the gamer, but also that was the pitch he made to people, yeah. which was, you know, there's a place that you can be free of all these things, where you could not be sort of put upon by the government and not be afraid of nuclear war and not be afraid of all these other things that um, will plague you on the surface. And we wanted that pitch to sort of resonate and make sense because that's otherwise by the time you got there you'd be like well this place is just fantasy nobody would ever come here and then the beauty of the place also is also tied into that it had to be a very attractive proposition or people who would believe that people would go leave their lives and go to the bottom of the ocean i'm sure in some ways you had to convince the team and enroll them in your sort of vision of you know who this character was going to be and what the setting was going to be. How, how did that work, Sean? I mean, did Ken come in and say, hey, I've been reading these books, and I think we could sort of... I believe he just came in one day on a, on a horse and said, <laughs> and ran, everybody read The Fountainhead. Exactly. I bought 30 copies of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you There's know... A seven, homework for the Here's a 2,000-page book or something. Yeah. Go, go read it. I mean, it really is more organic. It, you know, like I said, we knew that we had this location, and you struggle to fill it with stories, and you struggle to find meaning of why... Why does this place exist? You know, what's my motivation? And as Ken started to explore Ayn Rand um, a little more and started talking to us about it, and we ha were having that conversation, and it's like, oh, this could totally work. Like, this is exciting. Like, this is something that really hasn't been done in a video game before. And if we had flipped it and come up with the idea first before the location, I don't think we would have really been that excited about it. But we had a location. And now we're trying to fill it with, with that story. And, and because of the order of operation there, you start to get excited. Like, oh, I could totally make this work. This, this, this is going to uh, really make it feel like a lived-in space. You know, as you think of sort of the, you know, the setting and you think of maybe a character or something, was there a moment that you, you think back and like, oh, like right then and there, like I, I got excited when you attached. For, and for right me, it was, go, it. it was going to Rockefeller Center okay. um, and seeing the visual. Uh -huh. so I, yeah, I saw this story before, but I, my wife and I were in New York and we went to Rockefeller Center, which was, if you go to Rockefeller Center, it basically looks exactly like Rapture. It's because yeah. every building, you're sort of encircled, it's this block in New York, or a couple of blocks in New York, where Radio City Music Hall is, and um, where 30 Rockefeller Plaza is, where you see that show 30 Rock, and the ice skating rink, and where they put the Christmas tree, and it's this very iconic location, but what's cool about it, it's all one, unlike the rest of the city, everywhere you look, it's one um, architectural style, it's Art Deco. And it's very iconic Art Deco. And my wife and I were there, and we were sort of working on the game, and we didn't have a visual style, and all of a sudden I started looking around, and I said, oh, this could be a visual for the game. Also, it was the geometry of it was actually quite conducive to making a video game, because it wasn't overly complicated geometry. Art Deco is quite old and simple. Old and geometric, yeah, and simple. And so my wife and I bought a couple of tourist cameras before, this is before iPhone right, cameras, exactly. you know. Throwaway cameras. Yeah, yeah throwaway cameras, those yeah. little Kodak things. And we just started photographing doorknobs and light fixtures and just sort of brought, we, you know, developed the photos. Remember that? Um, yeah. and brought them in and said, Oh, like, the officers are stacked the stuff a stack of photos. Uh, I'll see you guys in a couple of years. Go, go make this. City where the artist would not be in a sense of where the scientists would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. And with the sweat of your brow, 
rapture can become your city as well. So you had kind of a, a theme, you came up with an art style, some of the iconic characters, and then you know you really had to build the narrative around it. Um, and you've talked about you know a lot of the, the themes in the game and you know greed, jealousy, sex, violence, all the things that sort of you know drive us or what destroy us. And that was something I think that you know as you thought about the, the story of the game, you wanted to I'm sure reflect some of those, right? Because I think people love the characters that sort of flawed in a way, and this is a a, a world which is its own little microcosm, but had a lot of tension inside of it. Yeah, I mean, the character Ryan was sort of, um, he, he's basically invisible through most of the game, right? You know, except for a very small portion. But he's very present because he exists, the city is him, right? You know, it's such a representation of him. We never want to cut away to a cutscene where you saw Andrew Ryan, you know, planning and scheming. We, we wanted him to be very present without actually being present. But once you had Ryan, and once you had his desire to protect this vision of his, you had a, you just had to then come up with the characters who'd be arrayed in opposition to him. So we had this character, the Big Daddy, and then eventually the character of Little Sister, and so characters like Tenenbaum came along. Like, you know, here's a person who's in opposition to him for this reason, and then yeah. you have, you know, for more noble reasons, and then you have a character like Atlas who's much more cynical yeah. opposition. Once we had all those characters arrayed, we're like, well, who are you? And you know, you ended up being a sort of you know a pawn in the middle of this of all this opposition to Ryan. We just kept her homing in on that theme and making you making sure that you weren't you know eventually figuring out that you couldn't just be here by an accident that you that you're an integral part of what this story even though you don't know you're an integral part of this story you you think you're just there by happenstance. Look, Mr. Bubbles, it's an angel. I can see light coming from his belly. Wait a minute, he's still breathing. It's all right. I know he'll be an angel soon. One of the biggest challenges Irrational faced when developing Bioshock was figuring out a way to retain the feeling of a deep RPG while making the game accessible to a broader console audience. Ultimately, the team succeeded in creating an intricate system of weapon and character upgrades that gave the player choice and customization while keeping the gameplay fast, lean, and engaging. One of the hallmarks of Bioshock, to me at least, was that it, it really blended RPG and sort of first-person action game together in a way that, you know, it's sort of standard today, but a decade ago was, was really pretty revolutionary. And I know for the team, I think at some point it became clear that you wanted this to work on consoles, not on PC, right? Well, both, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so the idea of, you know, doing a console game and a PC, a PC game and doing something that sort of felt like a shooter but had much more depth. And I know in, in some of the early design docs you talked about sort of creating an FPS plus versus an RPG light. What was the difference in your mind between those two? I think for us is the game of the big difference between System Shock and Bioshock ended up being that System Shock was more about your character growth and Bioshock was more about the environment. Because with System Shock, we really didn't have System Shock 2. We didn't really have the either the art team to make enough assets or the visual power to sort of make a, comp a really convincing environment. But as we started working on Bioshock, the art team was so strong that the ability to tell a story within the environment became the most important thing about the game. And that was sort of not something we thought right at the beginning. That was not really a concept we had. But as we started building things, we could realize that the visual world was the star of this thing, that Rapture was really the star of this thing. And telling the story outside of cutscenes, telling it in the world, so the gamer could discover the story rather than us telling him the story, telling him or her the story. And it was still very much for the time, oh, I think for the time, quite different than what you had seen in terms of, there wasn't a lot of growth in shooters. So right. it was still, I think for the time, very, very revolutionary. But I think System Shock 2 was even more ahead of its time in terms of, of that growth thing um, because we defocused a little bit. Primarily, part of it was to just figure out how to do that all on a console controller was, was very tricky.
No, I remember even the early demos of people like, you know, you see a pause when you see like a upgraded weapon, people are like, oh, I've never seen that before in a shooter. And that was, you know, when you were coming out of the sort of, you know, the Quake, Doom, half like where it's like you have, you know, eight weapons on the keyboard and you sort of knew what they were and they weren't going to change. Yeah. Sean, was that something that, you know, from a sort of creative standpoint, was it always clear that that was something you guys wanted to do or it evolved over time because you wanted to have more depth in the game? I mean, it certainly evolved over time and each you know, upgrade path was slightly, you know, had its own unique challenges. Like certainly upgrading the weapons, you had to design a base weapon that didn't feel like crap. Still felt like something that you wanted to use, but then the ability to add the upgrades to, to that and each of the upgrades could come in any order. So you have to be aware that this, you know, parts A, B, and C could come in at any different time to upgrade the weapon. In a first person shooter, that's your star. That's the thing that you're seeing all the time. When it comes to other things, plasmids, uh, Things that are, you know... Tonics. Tonics, yes, sorry. It's been a while. Come on, Sean. <laughs> I know, it's ten years. Those things were more offloaded to machines that you would then have to interact with so you're not carrying the inventory around with you. But each each of these decisions on you know how we're going to upgrade the player, you know, it wasn't like a mouse and keyboard, okay, we can just use the mouse and you have all these buttons at your disposal. You could arbitrarily point at a part of the screen really yeah. easily, which you could do in System Shock too. Yeah, so we certainly, you know learned trial by fire when we were trying to adapt these things to the console at the time. Yeah, and like having you know different ammo types and stuff like that. Like we went through numerous, numerous iterations of the interface to make it like we had the first times when we sort of put the interface into play, it was very obtuse and very tricky to get your head around and we just kept working on it and working on it and working on it because you want to feel like second nature and but that was we spent a lot of time on that. What motivated the idea of having uh, so much choice in the way you could sort of play through this game? What was it to you know give the player a, a better sense of authorship over the experience, or what, what was driving that? I've always liked the idea of giving the player a lot of agency in terms of their play style and experimenting with the play style and trying different things and seeing what worked and didn't work and interacting with the environment. The notion that it's sort of a playground that you get to play around with and, and imprint your own desire on was great because I think we were more skeptical about being able to do that with story at the time. In fact, so much to the point where that became almost like a joke. You know, that becomes the meta joke of the game of how little agency you have in, in, in your story. But agency in terms of how you play the experience and how you load out your weapons and how you interact with the environment. As compared to most shooters at the time where basically like you can shoot them with the shotgun or shoot them with the, you know, the pistol. That was really important to us. So we spent a lot of time trying to make the game, the world react in a way that you would expect and hope it to react when you tried something. Right. And some of those system or decisions we made about systems fed back into the narrative, like locking Adam behind Big Daddy and the little sister. Like you can't get at him unless you deal with the big daddy, which then becomes a roving boss fight, which then becomes another system that, I don't know if we planned that from the start or it was one of those happy, like, you know, serendipity, like, oh, this decision that we made about putting Adam behind the big daddy totally works because now we have a different type of boss fight that you hadn't really seen uh, actually, in other games. Actually, it was, bad. it was the other way because what happened was is originally there was no concept of Adam and big daddy just had money and other treasure on them like every other splicer. Yeah. And they were so tough, nobody would ever fight them because why on earth would yeah. you go after that guy? Right, you go off a bunch of small slicers and get the same amount. Yeah. So we had to come up with a, a currency that was exclusive to them because yeah. we knew that was where the fun was, right? But we also knew people were terrified of them and we didn't want to fight right. them. Yeah. So game, video game development and system development is a lot like economics, right? You know, in economics, you try to encourage certain behaviors through tax, usually through tax policy. You know, well, you want business growth, so you lower taxes on, on certain segments of the business economy or you want encourage you know people to move into this area so you make incentives to move in here we had to make an incentive for players to fight the big daddy and adam became that incentive and then once you had this adam then you had a new piece of narrative which you they could then incorporate back into the story yeah. Shot next. Easy now, Doctor. He's just looking for a wee bit of Adam. Just enough to get by. I'll not have him hurt my little ones. Talk a bit about the 
the plasmids and the vending machines and that sort of whole approach to, I guess, what is kind of a tech tree, but, you know, and coming from PC games, you know, used to strategy games and whatnot with very complicated ways of how you would upgrade things. I thought you guys did a really interesting, you had a really interesting approach to how you made it very accessible to a console audience. How did that evolve? Was like, did you know the vending machines were going to be there from the get-go? Well, we had vending machines in System Shock 2, so we were sort of lifting that, and I always thought that was a fun um, it was a fun notion to because it's a it's a affordance that people already understand. You know, they see a machine, a vending machine, they know immediately. Oh, that's where I buy stuff, right? Yeah. And you also then have to have a shopkeep. When we talked about wanting to make things, put limitations on ourselves so things felt fully believable. Yeah. If we had a shopkeeper sitting there, you can't shoot him. He right. sits there. He doesn't say anything. Right. And all of a sudden, he feels fake. Where a vending machine, the Circus of Values machine, can feel 100% authentic. You know, despite the fact that it's selling like ammo and stuff like that, you know, which is you but know. in an objective of society where you don't have rules and regulations right. on you that type of thing, lot. it feeds back into the narrative. But you don't then break the fiction at all by having these characters who sort of don't really live and breathe in the world. So the vending machines became an important part of that. But we still want to give them character, and hence the cl- you know, and so. That clown image came from a piece of, um, that image is actually from like a, a fruit container or something uh-huh. from like the 1940s. Okay. And so we had a book of like royalty free images and I saw that image and I'm like, let's call, let's put that clown on it. We'll call it Circus of Values. And then, you know, we wrote lines, lines for it, decided he'd be this sort of asshole clown. And then, um, then we hired the best actor in the world uh-huh. to play that part. That was, that was me. Uh, <laughs> well, and I cost the, my biggest advantage. I didn't cost anything. Um, I didn't know you were really. I was a clown. I was a clown. I hear it in my head every day. So. My wife hates that voice. She <laughs> hates that voice. You can give us a little of it right here. Welcome to the Circus of Values. She does not allow me to do that, so oh, I'll okay. do it outside of the house. Okay. But it, it allowed us to it allowed us to have something that felt very rich and very real while being very limited at the same time. And also, you know, the plasmids and sort of the motif of sort of the videos and how you explain sort of what a plasma was, that was a really fun way, I thought, to sort of explain that. Sean, how did you guys evolve that? Because it was a very art- Again, artistic I think, approach. I think those came on pretty late, too, because we, you know, we were developing all these systems and you make the assumptions because you're dealing with them every day that the player who gets this game is going to understand what these systems are. And you know, we always joke that you can't ship a developer of the game or you can't expect somebody to have a readme file for all these things. Nobody's understanding what these plasmids are or how to use them. How do we present these to the audience in, in such a way that they're going to understand what it is fictionally and what it is functionally? Because Rob Waters did a lot of the, the animations on those. And we sit down and we, you know, write out like a little 30 second commercial of what this thing is. And again, because going back to the narrative, this is what would happen in Rapture. People are trying to sell these things, so they would come up with commercials to explain why you need this. Using that as, as your framework, you can then come up with all of these you know, little little gags that people will remember that have a little personality to them, but I think ultimately in the end weren't that expensive to, no, to I mean, create because they were cheap. I think the, one of the most important things about it is we sent we, we didn't want them to be long and we didn't have a lot of budget for the arts. We have like a couple of frames of animation in yeah. them essentially. And so we had to figure out how do we message how this thing works in like that. And, and that's what marketing is, right? You know, it's how do you message what, how something works. And marketing and tutorializing are very similar things, right? You're trying to get a message across in a very brief period of time in a very snappy fashion. And I think that one of the things that I, I always felt about games is that tutorials are sort of death. And because they're usually like, you know, the, you go into a scene and there's like a, tra- a shooting range or something like that and you narratively they never really make sense either and they're so boring and so we always try to put a big burden on ourselves of, of how do we train people while not letting them know they're being trained and brevity is really important to that so we sort of we had a bunch of art constraints on that which also led to a bunch of writing constraints and so those things were like I don't even know if they were 30 seconds. Yeah, they were really short. Seconds. Yeah, 15 seconds long. We had to explain the whole plasmid in that period of time. Yeah. And I think that was a good exercise because it also made the game, it forced us to be concise and to really explain what the thing was like that. Throw objects at foes. You can even catch grenades and throw them back.
From the moment you boot up Bioshock, you can feel the story grab hold of you. A plane crashes at sea, a mysterious lighthouse, a sprawling city beneath the ocean, hooking the player from the first touch without overwhelming him with convoluted RPG mechanics was key to the success of the game and the skillful ramping up of Bioshock's legendary gameplay. Bioshock has an amazing opening sequence that I can't imagine the game without it, with uh, you know, the plane and sort of the crash. But I understand that didn't come online until like the very end of development. Sean, is that true? We had a couple of really depressing play tests. We had built all these systems. We thought we were doing a good job of like giving basically people a playground to play with and, and things to do. And when we had a play test, we man, we didn't realize how bad of a job we were doing in exposing those systems to the player because we were so in you know in these systems and in our own heads we had no idea that we just weren't facing them towards the player at all so a after that play test you know we, we took a long cold look at what we were doing and realized that we had to introduce the, we were confident enough in the systems that they were going to be fun and meaningful to the player but we really had to think about how we we're going to introduce these systems to the player and in such a way that they understand why the systems were there. Like, you can't ship a readme file with the game and expect people to read it. Like, it has to be part of the experience. So the challenge is, how do you introduce people to these systems, but do it in such a way that it fits within the narrative? So we had to integrate all of these things into the story cleanly so that the player felt like it was one, you know, one smooth experience. And I think the zap them and whack them thing was and one the one of those. Two, and the one-two punch. Yeah, the one-two punch that came out of that. The plane sequence at the beginning, I, I heard a story that like a programmer put that together in like a day or two, and it was a, it was a very last minute thing, right? It was, so we had done a focus test, and um, we had had, it was one of the most depressing experiences in my life, because we were very close to being finished, and we, it was basically giving people what essentially became the demo, and people played it, and they... And it was in Boston, and we were sort of behind these glass windows, all these sort of Boston guys, and like, ah, oh, this is a wicked piece of shit. You know, they, they hated it, and they were making fun of it, and they were saying, you know, it's like, it's like watching some guys from Guys and Dolls getting, you know, beating each other up, and it's the stupidest thing they've ever seen. And we thought we were in pretty good shape at that point. And I remember the focus test guy was like sort of, sort of like a doctor giving me the bad news. You yeah. know, Sorry, Ken, you better get your affairs in order. Right. And... um we, went, we all came into work the next day, and we were like, what are we going to do? And we're all pretty depressed, but um, I think we started talking. And as we talked, we started thinking about what are they saying to us? What are these people saying to us? What, we think there's something there. What, how are they missing it? And we decided that there was, maybe they didn't understand who they were and who their role in the, as a character, who their role in the world was. Because the game at that point started with you in the ocean, right. floating in the ocean after the plane crash. And the crash still it was in the fiction, it just wouldn't it, show. You just didn't yeah. see it. So you yeah. didn't have the voiceover saying, my parents always said I was going to do great things or whatever that. They didn't show the plane crash. We didn't establish a time period. Because, huh. you know, the plane is critical to establishing you're smoking a cigarette. It's very 1960s looking. Um, the, all that stuff was established. It wasn't established. So we decided we had no time and no money and no... So we sort of came up with a script... We, you know, we, I wrote some lines, a line, I think, Nate, one of our artists, recorded the line. Steven and Sean and those guys got to work on building this very simple sequence, which was the, well, simple, um, straight, relatively simple yeah. um, sequence. And then the plane crash actually happens over the, a, the, dot, the uh, Bioshock logo we already had. Yeah. But I sort of wrote, we wrote a radio play behind that with, uh -huh. you know, altitude, altitude of the crash. And that, I think, set the emotional, and the people screaming in terror on the plane crash, that set the emotional tenor much better and explained who the player was. And all of a sudden, we released, then I think the next real encounter we had was people playing the demo, yeah. public encounter, and all of a sudden it was a very different experience. No, I, I remember even back in the day, we did, I think we did a thing on TV where you kind of talked about it. It was like that night, and I remember that night, like people on the forums were just like going nuts. And even though the game had, I think, had a lot of press attention, when people finally had to play it and go through that sequence, yeah, I just remember there was this mass sort of excitement around it, and then the game shipped only 
a few weeks after that, right? A month after or a, that? Oh, a, few, a week later, a few days later. It's amazing, like, now to, to hear that, like, literally, like, a month before the game came out, like, the plane sequence came online or something. I mean, it was that late. <laughs> then, uh, yeah, well, we saw it go through certification and all yeah, that. Yeah, so, so it's yeah. like within, you it wasn't, know. It wasn't far. It wasn't, no. it wasn't far. It was really last minute. And it was one of those things where, like, you really shouldn't be putting in content that yeah. late. Yeah. But, but we felt it. we were so close to having something good that we just rolled the dice on it. And um, we worked really hard on it. Like, it, yeah. we had, we worked really hard. I remember how much time I spent on just that recorded of altitude. After that, I could still hear yeah. the different version of that in my head. Because we spent so much time on that stuff. And these guys were working on and the, getting uh, the, the animations right. And the, the scene <clears throat> was shot in engine, but we decided to pre-render it so that we had to do less QA on it. Right. There oh, was really? no, it wasn't going to be some like weird streaming error or crash error. Wow. It was just like, so we're just going to show the video. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because once you start in the ocean, the, we have this experience with testing a lot, but the water effects and how beautiful Steven's water effects were, people didn't realize they were out of a cutscene cut at that point. Yeah, and right. so they would just sit there and stare. And then right. they pick up the controller. Yeah, and yeah, they pick up a controller and all of a sudden they realize they were controlling thing. But they, but that, yeah, as Sean said, that part of the plane is not actually interactive. It was done in the engine, but we, we just filmed it. Now, as you, people were playing through the game and you were testing it, I'm sure there was debate about, you know, when would you introduce this plasmid, sort of what would the ramp be? Did that change at all, sort of as you got towards the end of development, about like, oh, we're going to give people the gun at this point, or it's like, we're going to trigger these plasmids at this point? Like, how did that work? So, like, we moved guns around. Like, A, for instance, there was a big debate about, originally you found a gun in the lighthouse, a pistol in the lighthouse. Oh, the very right there, yeah. And, because it's a shooter, right? Like, what the hell? And we had a lot of debates about it, and I feel that it was important that we didn't do that because the fact that you sort of go through a lot of the experience without being having the distraction of a gun is important to getting you immersed in the world because you know when you when you have a uh, all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail right but you don't have the hammer so you just sort of had to take in the world and have that feeling of fear and um, like I know when you saw that splicer bounding around on the ceiling that you couldn't do anything about it. and that had, had even though that's no, those why, are those moments right like I remember yes. when I Played on real for the first time, where it's like you're you're trapped and there's a monster and you can't do it, and the lights go out. It's like th that's the moment with the splicer where you're like, I want to do something, but I can't, I can't and that yeah. evokes an emotion. I remember we kept, you know, moving machine where the machine gun appeared yeah. around and where various plasmids appeared around. It was a real. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a real fine-tuning process. Yeah, and it gave us an opportunity, like especially with the shotgun, to to really present the weapons, like put some space between right. them. It's I a think, moment when you finally. Yeah, I think yeah, like we get Paul, the shotgun Paul sequence. Paul Helquist was yeah. yeah, he put the sequence together for the um, when you see the shotgun laying in the pool of light. Like every, every game developer knows what that means. You know, you know the minute you pick that thing up, something's going to happen. But it was still a very effective way, as I'm remembering it, to, oh, look, I've been waiting for this thing, I'm going to pick it up, and now you have an immediate opportunity to use it. But, you know, at the same time, we're trying to ramp up the tension level by having the splicers kind of on the outside of, of the light, so you can't really see them, and then coming in one at a time and attacking you. Yeah. And we had very little, actually very few tools to really control how they, those splicers acted, so how they were set up and how the environment was lit was really important. You know, those well, there's are, even other things like when you get the TK plasmid, I don't think we had a lot of physical space and opportunity and time to really present that. So we came up with the narrative that, you know, it was the doctor's office and he used TK to practice tennis. And we had the turret in there that threw tennis balls at you. So if you wanted to, you could catch the tennis balls and throw them and you can knock things down. I think it revealed uh, pickups that you could then, you know, pull to yourself with TK. But we're always trying to think of like little backstories that we could do. It doesn't have to be as involved as, as the shotgun ambush. Sometimes it's just, oh, let's take a grenade turret and turn it into a tennis ball because, turret. Because we want to, <laughs> yeah, like, because I, I remember like the impulse was, you know, I've been to dentist office and there's always some like weird aspect of the, the dentist personality. They always want to get through their office, you know, yeah. they just have to have their hobby right. featured yeah. in some way. <laughs> and so we saw an opportunity there to both feature this, he's a tennis nut and teach TK at the same time. And the
Rapture is overflowing with memorable locations and set pieces. In developing a world that feels organic, lived in, and functional, a rational managed to create a space that feels perfectly suited to the story and action that takes place in it, which begs a question, did the plot shape the location, or did the plot fit squarely into a world that was already established? Let's talk about some of the areas in Rapture because it, it's an amazing place, but also it, it feels like there's certain areas that are very well designed and that they have, you know, a very certain aesthetic and the characters in there, it all kind of comes together. So Ken, do you have a, a part of Rapture that resonates the most with you still to this day? I think the opening is always going to be the most important to me because it's, um, we spent a lot of time there and it was all for me as a challenge as a narrative guy is sort of how do we set up a very complex series of events and a very complex notion and this all this you know andrew was so much to tell big daddies and little sisters and andrew ryan and the time period and and do that all without cutscenes. And especially, I think, the descent to rapture when you're in that, when you go to the bathosphere, you know, getting that right, getting everything right down to the, you know, the, the, the bathosphere cresting the hill and seeing the city for the first time. Remember how much we worked on the timing of that? Just getting that. And it took us forever to figure out that we should just put the slide projector covering the window. Like, uh -huh. again, in hindsight, it seems like such an obvious choice, but we were really trying to figure out, like, how are we going to tell this story of Ryan and then reveal so you can see that you know the city beyond the hill and also we didn't have to show the whole transition going down yeah. the bottom of the ocean because the whole screen was covered <laughs> spoiler alert i think that's the part that will always be near to, near and dear to my heart yeah i mean for me it was cashmere yeah. um that was one of the first the, re the restaurant at the beginning yeah the restaurant at the beginning because it was really like the first art box that we created that was rapture i mean we created spaces before that weren't really hitting the Art Deco look. Scott Sinclair had just started, and he he built that uh, design and built that statue, uh, the Atlas with the um, the world on his shoulders that was in the middle of the room. And uh, Mauricio uh, had done some concept art for us of of that space. And once we started putting everything together and getting it into engine, and actually walking around it and seeing those giant windows off to the side that had that just showed the seascape and really drove home the fact that you were underwater. This was the first time really all the elements started to come together. And we actually were, we had built a bunch of stuff and we actually stepped back and said, we have to just get one room right before we go any further because we weren't getting it right. And so Mauricio did that concept drawing yep. and we worked really hard on that statue. And that statue I think was the first object we really built in the game that yep. was a Bioshock. So we just stayed in that room for like a month until we got it right. And I think the original concept actually had a tram Yes, running through it, it so it was like even more complicated and that was one of those things where we had to keep pulling back and pulling back to really focus on what the bare essence of that room was. Were there parts of Rapture that you never were able to realize that you sort of still the zoo. in the zoo? People we had a zoo Frolic, right? that I was excited about. Not everybody was excited about the zoo, but I don't know why I was excited about the zoo because it would have been cool. a nightmare. We had another area that was prior to Arcadia that was more of a straight up uh, agriculture, forest type of area. Before we had the bathospheres, we had a whole sort of subway transport system in Rapture, which we spent a lot of time thinking about, and then just realized that these little submersibles would be a much better, much more realistic and much better solution. Are you were going to be able to move between locations in that subway system? Yeah, much like much like, much like the um, much like the bathospheres, but they were much more integrated throughout the space, and we yeah. really want to support them. And we just realized it was not a, it was not, yeah. it was not really relevant to what right. we were doing. Were there certain locations or areas where you knew a certain narrative point, you know, needed to happen? Like you look at, uh, you know, the reveal of sort of Atlas's true motivations. Like was that like, oh, we've got to do it this part, this level, because it fits the story? Or was it more that you sort of like, you had the game laid out in a certain order and just layered the story on top of it? I think the big one I can think of is that you encounter Ryan in his sort of like, that he would live in an area of industry. Okay. You know, so he lives in this very industrial area because that's where he would feel most comfortable. Uh -huh. um, and that we wanted his, his office, his lair to sort of be not in some, you know, 
residential zone, but right. where he wants to wake up and smell the grease fires and you know and the and the and the machines and the smoke. Uh, that's that's in his lifeblood. Industry is his lifeblood. But it also had to be very theatrical. Like if you look at it right now, it doesn't look like an office. You kind of know it's an office because it's the story is is right. telling you that. Set, yeah. um, and we had some old technology that was laying around um, in the game that would control environment settings. So we, old system that we had would cause let you do high pressure, low pressure, medium pressure. And those would affect lighting and um, other like post-process things in the world. And that was a system that was cut, but because the code was in, we were always trying to figure out ways to use it. And one of the ways that we used it was in the Andrew Ryan sequence, because we didn't have a lot of narrative storytelling tools. We were basically switching the atmosphere to get all the lighting changes. So when any, whenever t a light changes in that scene, we're telling the game that the atmosphere is changing. So and then the preset atmospheres come in and, and shine the spotlights on them or bring up the house lights when we need them to. It was very very early on, you could change the pressure in the areas, and that would change how explosions work and all this stuff like that. And we just couldn't figure out how to make it gettable it back, for the yeah. player. We couldn't make it feedback, but we still had all those. That that moved a lot of levers in the game, so we still had the system. So we used it for the sort of theatrical cues of the you know very theatrical cues of. Ryan appearing, the lights going down where you are, and the lights coming up where he are, uh, where he is, because the engine didn't have those tools by default. The assassin has overcome my final defense, and now he's come to murder me. In the end, what separates a man from a slave? Money, power, no. A man chooses. A slave obeys. And there was a great sense of sort of artistic progression as you went through the game too, and that you know each level had its own sort of voice. Was that something that you know a lot of games as they move further in development, it's like oh we sort of ran out of time, we can, you know it's like we're just going to sort of repeat this and change the color palette. It felt like I mean for the team it was very defined from early on that you wanted each each sort of level, which they were levels back in the day, to feel distinct? Yeah, I mean, we had a, we had sort of um, experimented with that back on System Shock 2, back when every Doom level looked pretty much like every other Doom level, um, because they were just working on the same set of assets. We decided with our very rudimentary tools in System Shock 2 that we would progress with color, yeah. and every deck would feel different from a color standpoint, even though most of that was lighting, not or textures, nothing really more. Yeah. But we have the tools to actually, you know, sort of theme levels. I think a lot of this goes back to, I think my first memory was actually from when I was one years old at the Montreal World um, Expo. World's you remember Fair. when you were one? Uh, well, I remember being at something at this World's Fair, which I didn't realize I think was in 1967 when uh -huh. I was one years old, uh -huh. a little over one years old. Uh -huh. And I was on a theme park ride they had with a, and I remember being at this thing where a big bat flies out of this sort of thing and comes up. I don't know why I was a one year old was on this ride. I'm not sure it's sort of a haunted housey kind of ride. And I, I remember loving it. And I think that stuck with me. So the notion of sort of theme parky themes and settings um, and Disney World does a great job of this. You can go to Disney World. They theme areas. So themed areas are something that always resonated with me. And Five Shop sort of always has had this notion of feeling of theme in different areas, much more than the real world has. Like you walk from building to building most then you can't really tell them apart. You right walk from there. Like, yeah, you know, walk from a floor of an office building to another floor. It's not going to look any different. But we, we always felt that was really important. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, if you look at Swap Four, you saw some early experiments with this, especially like the serial killer's house level in Swap Four, um, which is probably one of the most dense levels that we ship. But you were trying to tell a specific story with that, and. Going straight into Bioshock and using the same exact engine that we were using, and we were very comfortable at that point with how the engine worked and how to art up these rooms, gave us a leg up when we sat down and really thought about what stories are we specifically trying to tell. And one of the one of my favorite anecdotes from this time period is um, with Sander Cohen. I think it was Nate Wells and Stephen Alexander sat down one night, and they came up with a backstory for every dead body that you find in that in that space and then they told that story with the props that they could even if it was just like this guy crawled three feet and then shot himself in the head because he was sad about something you know they put those marks in maybe put a picture next to the guy and then he shot himself so they, they really like did their homework and tried to add you know the backstory for everything that you're going to find in that space i've got atlas's comb 
Rhodes hitting us non-stop and two dead mechanics just this week. We need to control costs. If I wanted to deal with amateurs, I would have stayed on dry land. The illusion of choice is a thinly veiled dynamic that drives many single player gaming experiences. And while many developers spend a lot of time trying to convince players that choice is real and authentic in their games, the truth more often is that choice is a superficial concept in gaming narrative. Bioshock confronted this idea head on, searing into our minds a innocuous three word phrase with an unforgettable new meaning. Would you kindly? Of course, one of the most memorable moments in the game is the would you kindly phrase and the reveal of uh, you know how that's been motivating the player throughout the entire game. Uh, it's still, to me, one of the you know, most classic kind of narrative moments in games in the past decade. What's interesting about that phrase is that it, it didn't always start like that. Can you tell us sort of about the evolution of sort of the you know the conditioning of the player and there was once Excelsior was the phrase once. Yeah, this is. <laughs> I'm trying to recall um, some of this. So I, we had the idea, like, because we had the Andrew Ryan scene very early, and we knew sort of all the events that would happen. There were phrases before there was would you kindly. The notion existed and what it meant and what it was, but we didn't actually have the phrase would you kindly until later. So we had a bunch of terms we threw in there. Cause, and like Excelsior was it for one point. That's probably because of my, my Stan Lee fanboyism. Was that like sort of throughout the game? It would have been like Excelsior. Just randomly there, saying There that. are some things when you're making games you just sort of throw in as like, we need Sounds something. Cool we need something. Right. We have over there, Excelsior, and then it sits there yeah. for a year, right. and then all of a sudden you kind of forget it's not good, right? right. And then yeah. until somebody comes along and says, "Dude, seriously, yeah," what, or Excelsior? you meant it to be like a stub in. You never right. meant yeah. to actually gain traction, and then you're like, "Oh crap!" But that sense of of some phrase or word being repeated throughout the game that you wouldn't really realize its meaning yes. um, until later. That was there very early on. Yes, yeah, and the fact that you would have something that seemed like a non-thing and then came back at you like a freight train later on was always it was there from pretty early. Sit. Would you kindly? Stand. Would you kindly? Run. Stop. Turn. A man chooses. A slave obeys. So that phrase evolved, but talk about that, I, you know, the sort of meta-narrative of, you know, being in a game, thinking that you have a sense of choice and making these decisions, but then obviously realizing that the, you know, the player ultimately didn't have a choice or was conditioned in a way that they would react to that. Um, that was, you know, sort of a, sort of a new idea for a game. Where did that come from on your side, Kevin? Was, was there sort of a deeper sort of, uh, you know, meaning behind it? No, look, I, I think I was always interested in the concept, you know, whether it's, you know, Oedipus, not to get too pointy headed here, but Oedipus sort of thinking he has, oh, I'm going to leave, you know, this city and go to another city because there's been this prophecy about me and I'm going to avoid my fate and I'm in complete control. And then finding out he's not in control at all to the Manchurian candidate, which is a story I love about, you know, somebody who, who you find out is just a puppet, you know, living a life of a man and fight club. You know, I always love those kind of stories about who am I and what is my, agency in this world because look we struggle I think everybody struggles that you know how much how much we really have control over and how much is you know our boss or parents or whatever telling us what to do so uh, that seemed like a natural thing for a story and because it came from movies that idea a lot and plays yeah. I, I don't think it, it was very there was a lot of it hadn't been explored in games really and games are particularly interesting because games because you feel like you, you are agency, yeah. Us, yeah and you're really being you know most games especially at the time you're really just being railroaded right. down a corridor it's very easy to underestimate gamers and i think probably i did a little of my own underestimation there that they would it would be a little too pointy headed for people but people seem to really engage because probably because it spoke to an experience they had a struggle as a gamer they've always had which is like i want to control but how much control do i really have in this game uh -huh. True. And, Sean, I mean, it was also something that, you know, was a great surprise when you played through the game, I'm sure, even for people on the team. Did everyone know that when Ken was sort of doing it, or did it was revealed as people played through it? I think, I mean, at some point, the, the entire team knew. Uh, it wasn't, um, it was something that was talked about 
uh, with a smaller group before you know it was bought to the entire team. Early on, when you when you heard the idea and you you just kind of clicks, right? You're like, okay, like I totally get this. Did like, people get it? I seem to remember a few people looking at me like I was, I was like a lunatic. Not maybe that not the specifics, and maybe it's the Excelsior. Or maybe you're talking about the Excelsior yeah, yeah, time, yeah. but the idea that. You don't really have choice, and exactly like you said, you you played through how many video games, and everybody's game is going to end the same way. You're going to kill these people. You're going to pass through these checkpoints, and you think you have a choice, but the only real choice is stop playing the game. So the the idea that we're kind of like taking that on resonated. Now the actual like, is it Excelsior or is it the Latin phrase I forgot, or if it's would you kindly see? Here's how I remember it, and I could be you know. I could I could be wrong. Yeah. I could remember being so surprised by the outside reaction because I remember the internal reaction being completely nobody connected or engaged to it. I mean, we worked on it. Yeah. Right? And so I was kind of surprised by the outside reaction because I kind of thought it was like, you know, as I said, it's a bit academic, right? Yeah. And and it, well, it could also be a function of we're playing well, it close to the vest. I could I could be misremembering it, or it could also just be a function of. Nobody making the game had the experience of playing it through and getting to that moment. Yeah, I mean, I mean like it was revealed you're... to them in advance of really playing it, so yeah. it wasn't that surprise. Yeah, they had seen it in all its really half-assed, st- you know, development well, stages and, and and out of order. Yeah, out of order, and all and that. it's not really something you can play test over an afternoon. It takes a little while to get to that point. You lack, you need to lack the knowledge about yeah. what the game is to be able to sort of have that um, experience all the way through. I know. You guys have talked about uh, you know the idea of Atlas, the you know the voice actor changing, and it was I guess very important that the you nailed that actor right, and, and you trusted that actor until there was sort of the, re- the Fontaine reveal and sort of understanding that. Yeah, trust was everything there, right? And so there was something about either the actor or the writing or the accent that just m- people immediately said this guy's no good. Right. When the, the first Atlas we had, because you have to trust this guy, and at least if you don't, there's no trust. There's no, you know, there's no punch in the gut. I think we've really focused on making him have personal stakes in the story as well. That he had his family trapped. Even of course, it was all fiction, right? But his fan, he had, he had, he had skin in the game. He, you know, he sort of spoke to you as a friend, and especially because the whole world was so hostile to you. I think it took a while to get that exactly right. Listen, I've got a family. I need to get them out of here. But the splicers have cut me off from them. If you can reach them in Neptune's bounty, then maybe, just maybe... I know you must feel like the unluckiest man in the world right now. But you're the only hope I'll ever see my wife and child again. Sean, what do you hope is the kind of lasting legacy of Bioshock? You know, ten years hence, a lot of things you guys were doing, uh, you know, have sort of been become common now, right, with, you know, upgrades and moral choices and games yeah. and whatnot, but it was really pioneering work um, a decade ago. When you reflect on it, what do you, what do you hope people remember the game for sort of pushing forward? For me, it's, it's telling a story with the medium and how we used everything available to us to tell that story. Um, we used the environment to set up the backstory of Rapture and really create a sense of space which I think is vitally important to getting the players to trust that, you know, to sit down and kind of like just be in the space and, and let these things happen. You know, even uh, even the radio logs, uh, the rudimentary animation that we had at the time, I mean, we really sat down with the tools that we had and at our disposal and tried to tell a meaningful story. I mean, not meaningful, but something that would be memorable to people that they could take away and, like you said earlier, had that water cooler moment where they're excited enough to, to talk about it after they put the controller down. So for me, I, I think the legacy is that um, it was a story well told. For me, it was a sense of place, being like the rapture is a real thing, even though it's not. You know, it's actually a very crude, you know, from the time, you know, a relatively crude bunch of polygons and texture maps. You know, it's only, the original games went 720, I think. And I played a lot of it when we were testing it on a 14-inch, on a like, you know, uh, SD television. That it still felt like a sense of place in the music and the, and the characters. That it's a real place. And I think that my memories of the Bioshock games is that I take away that Rapture's a real place and Elizabeth's a real person. Those are the two sort of big things that stick with me with those two games. And that's sort of what I'll always, you know, carry forward with me in my life. Bioshock is, you know, it's a place, but as we saw with Infinite, I mean, it's an idea, and it's a sort of a type of game. I think a lot of people say, like, oh, this is a, you know, a type of experience. Um, when you think about, you know, 
your career where you guys want to go. I mean, do you, that idea of those types of games, do you miss it now that you've sort of moved on to other things now, or do you feel like it's sort of you've closed that chapter? I mean, it's always a part of what you do. Like, System Shock 2 was a part of Bioshock. There were, but it, it wasn't System Shock 2. It was, it was a gro- you know, you're growing past that and trying out new things. I, I think Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite and even going back to Swap 4, those will always be a part of my experience as a game developer and, and what we're trying to do with the medium. So I don't think it's something that you just draw a line and say, you know, we'll never return because there's always lessons that you can learn and things that you bring with you to the, to the next project that you're working on. I don't think the new game is going to, like, people are, like, are not going to be surprised that it's a, this game is a new game from us. They're going to see a lot of what we had done in, before in terms of world building and aspects of storytelling. Um, the goal is to sort of, you know, move away from the you really have no choice kind of, kind of thing. And that's a very, 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 very hard problem because we spent years working on. But we're building upon a foundation of stuff we've done before, um, just trying to go in a different direction with it. But... It's, it's, it's always going to be part of our DNA. city where the artist would not be a censor, where the scientist would not be bound by any morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. And with the sweat of your brow, rapture can become your city as well.
Thank <laughs> you. 